Welcome and thank you for being here at the 28th annual Bronx Speak Up. Let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Here we are. So welcome to the Bronx's Blooming's presentation. This year we're talking about flower power or the power of native plants. I'll be your presenter. My name is Aviva Van Pelt. So quickly about me, um, I'm the volunteer outreach engagement coordinator at the Bronx is Blooming. Um, I partner with the Bronx is Blooming through New York City Civic Corps and AmeriCorps program. Here are some action shots from some volunteer events. Um, one was an invasive species removal and one we were just planting some native plugs. Uh, a little bit about our organization. We're a Bronx-based nonprofit organization focusing on environmental stewardship, community building, and youth leadership. We aim to encourage communities to advocate for the care of their parks and green spaces. In these photos are volunteers along with our staff at some of our events, which anyone can sign up for. I'll provide information at the end if you'd like to get involved. I can personally tell you that they are so much fun. The connections you make at these events, the kind of people that sign up, it's just very, very fun. So since 2011, we've made a lot of change thanks to our supporters and volunteers. We've provided training and seasonal jobs at 280 plus Bronx youth, uh, worked with 18,000 volunteers, adding up to 126 thousand plus hours of service, including stewarding 14,000 plus trees and 16,000 plus native plants at 20 plus Bronx parks and green spaces. Sometimes when I see numbers, I get confused. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, these photos here are some of our volunteers. Uh, the top one is um, our Fordham students uh, at Fordham Go um, making seed balls. And um, yeah, a lot of fun. The next slide here we have are just some of our parks. Uh, not only do we work on the True Parkway, but we also work in Soundview, Cretona, St. Mary's, Malully, Happen, and many others. So today, what will we be discussing? Let me get rid of this. What will we be discussing? Um, just a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about continuing on. So just a little bit about uh, invasive species because I feel to understand what native species are, we must examine what their counterpart is. Uh, just a little bit about why they're harmful and we're just gonna take a look about uh, a couple of species to further our clarification. Um, and we're also gonna look at another category of species called non-native or exotic um, and how they differ from invasive and maybe an example. Um, now we are going to transition after that to what are native or endemic species? Um, why are they different from the above two? And some examples. Okay, moving on. So invasive species. From here forward, I will be mostly referring to species by their common names. But if you're taking notes, I do recommend writing down the scientific names. So with that, we have a definition here. Invasive species, a species introduced to a new environment causing it ecologic or economic harm. Sometimes these species were brought to a new place for their uses, such as medicinal. However, this causes more harm than good with no natural predators or ecosystem they belong in. They spread unnaturally fast and take up space meant for native species. So here we have two invasives we see a lot, we work with a lot, um, porcelain berry and reed grass. Uh, what do we mean by more harm than good? Just to clarify, do the benefits of this plant outweigh the negatives of introducing it to a new area? With invasives, the answer is no, since they cause so much destruction to a, a delicate balance that took thousands, if not millions of years to establish. Moving on to our examples, um, 
mugwort. We see this one a lot in New York City parks. Um, mugwort has an extremely dense root system. Um, this makes it a nightmare to control. Their roots actually grow sideways. So um, when you pull them out, they actually tend to regrow very easily. Um, it was brought here by Canadian missionaries. Here's what it looks like, kind of like cilantro. Next, we're going to be talking a little bit about Japanese barberry, another invasive. It has completely taken over New York City forest understories. Deer don't eat it. It's not controlled, not enough by predators, um, and it's extremely harmful because, for one thing, it displaces our native woody plants. Also, its leaf litter changes the chemistry of the soil, making it more basic. Um, also, it's the host to the white-footed deer mouse. This contributes to the spread of Lyme disease. No one likes Lyme disease. This is what it looks like in a couple of seasons. We're going to now touch on our non-native or exotic species now. Um, so the power of plants. We can rely on plants for many things. Medicine, food, shade, air, nutrients, beauty. And I actually want to just take a minute to acknowledge the beauty of plants alone as an incredible gift. Um, invasive species also, of course, provide these things. But the issue with planting them is that they cause more harm than good. This scale again, right? More harm than good. So now... There's another category, non-native exotic species. These plants are not part of the local biodiversity, not originally from here, but they also are not harmful to the environment in which they're introduced. Many non-native species aren't harmful, but they also do not particularly beneficial to our ecosystem. So they might not particularly benefit any of our native pollinators or anything like that. Um, an example of this is tomatoes. Um, so what makes them different, right? Seeds aren't carried, they're not spread everywhere, they're not out of control, they're more controllable, less prolific. All these things kind of make these species different, right, from invasive species. So moving on now to native species. Native species is a part of the balance of nature that's developed over thousands or millions of years in a particular region or ecosystem. Native plants are important because the native animals, insects, and ecosystem of the region rely on them to maintain balance. We have two photos here. The bottom one is from our pollinator garden in Cortona Park. It's a garden in which every plant was handpicked to support native pollinators. We would love nothing more than to have you come and help us with the care of it this spring. Now the top one, these guys are everywhere right now. Sweet gum, take a walk down the street to the bodega. You're gonna see these seed pods everywhere. The power of native plants. Now we're getting to our native plants here. Um, the portion of the presentation moving forward is going to be all of our native species that we're going to be talking about now, um, our examples. So here we have sassafras. So sassafras is the preferred host to the insect known as the leafhopper. Sassafras used to be a key ingredient in root beer, the root specifically, all the way until 1960. So along with what you see here on the screen, a tea is also made from the root bark, helping with colds, kidney issues, and gastrointestinal issues. And actually, its oil is still used in soaps, perfumes, and toothpastes. So very versatile plant. This is what it looks like. Moving on to my favorite plant, this is witch hazel. Um, very great plant. Additionally to what you see here, um, its leaves are placed externally for bruises. Um, and yeah, I mean, witch hazel has a long history in the cosmetics. You might see it in your local Walgreens. Here's what it looks like. Very cute little yellow flowers. 
Um, it actually blooms when nothing else is actually in bloom. So in the late fall, even into the winter, um, you just see these bright yellow flowers against the white snow pops. Um, during the winter, our white-tailed deer really like to eat it. Next, we have our sundial lupine. Edible, medicinal, improves mulch. Great plant for a lot of things. Yeah, these guys, these guys just take over New Hampshire. I mean, you drive down the highway, all you see is blue and purple. Very beautiful plant. This is what it looks like. So these guys are actually really important as a larva food source for many butterfly species, such as the federally endangered Kerner blue butterfly. Worth noting. Uh, next, we have the common milkweed. This plant has many uses in both the edible plant category and the textile category. So any artists here, any cooks here, this plant is definitely for you. Um, milkweed, obviously you see a bunch of things here, but it's also a great resource for, um, I mean, many things. Definitely um, American, Native American tribes got a lot of use from this plan, as can we seed floss, as you see here. Um, it's actually still used in life jackets today. Kind of interesting. This is what it looks like. I just think it's stunning. While we are on the topic of milkweed, which by the way, is the host to the monarch butterfly. I remember learning about that in second grade or something. Um, I just wanna talk about our pollinator garden really quick. Our pollinator bed in Crotona Park largely features milkweed. So a pollinator bed is huge for green infrastructure and we'd love to show you how it works. We have a little TikTok here for you, just to give you that visual effect. I think this TikTok's great. You can see like the stages of it being made. I think that's so cool. Like it literally went from being a bed of nothing, of weeds to being like this. It, it's really incredible. Um, so what plants do we have in our pollinator garden and why? Well, here we have the purple coneflower or Echinacea purpurea, starting from the left hand side. Um, so this is actually also, if you wanna do some research, this is a highly medicinal plant also, um, but it's here to support our native bee species. Uh, next we have the Coreopsis. Um, this supports butterfly and bee species. And in the same photo, we also have the New England aster. Yeah, and that species actually supports so many bee species, including the long tongue, bumble, honey, minor, and large leaf cutting. Under that are two species of phlox supporting bee and butterfly species. We have the wild sweet william on the right, um, moss phlox on the left, and next door to that are the blazing star and black eyed Susans, which attract monarchs. Next to that, we've got some New York ironweed. Um, attracting our bees. Um, next to that is our, uh, next to our purple coneflower, I'm sorry, is um, the Joe Pye weed. And this attracts both butterflies and bees. Lots of amazing, beautiful plants in this pollinator garden, definitely worth checking out. 
So here I wanted to include a larger photo. This is mountain mint. Um, as you can see here, the blue winged wasps love it. Um, in the photo to the right, the plant on the lower left is Asclepius. And I just wanna mention that we trim this bed from weeds to truly impactful plants. Now on the bottom is a photo of everything. Moving on, this is spice bush. Now, if there's any bakers here today, this plant is truly for you because it can be ground up into a spice as a substitute for allspice. I just think that's so cool. Um, also, additionally to what you see here, also a steam bath of the twigs can ease aches and pains in the body. I know I have a lot of those. So I also want to mention, super important, that spice bush is the host for the spice bush swallowtail and how essential this plant is for this butterfly. This is what it looks like. Next, we have trade scantia. So trade scantia often is eaten as a salad. The leaves can be eaten raw or cooked, as can the flowers. So we actually have not planted trade scantia yet, but come out with us and we could do some meadow planting and afterwards we could have a spiderwort salad. This plant is valuable for our native bumblebee species. Very stunning color. Um, next we have blue false indigo, a great one to end with. So bumblebees collect pollen and also suck the nectar from this plant. And historically Native Americans has, have used it as a digestive. And lots of other things, as you can see here. Here's our indigo. You really can find these things everywhere. I mean, I used to live upstate and like, I feel like I saw these things everywhere. So we made a list to help navigate nurseries and make it easier for you to find plants which are not only native, but also support our pollinators. Please feel free to screenshot, take a photo, take a note, whatever you want to do. Um, you can also always come back to the slide. Um, we'll provide you with um, this presentation afterwards if you would like it. You can always go back. Lots of really great plants on this list. Here's just a few more, and these really do contribute to the conversation about how we choose to steward our parks and gardens and yards. Um, yeah, we really do have a responsibility of stewardship. Um, and it's important what, what plants we pick, you know? Um, it, this is because, I mean, it's, that's what makes the difference, right? Like all of our land in this country is in like preserved parks and like gardens and space that like no one can touch. A lot of it is backyards. A lot of it is space that we choose what goes in it. So it's important that we plant stuff that is going to support our ecosystem. Follow us, definitely follow us. We have some really exciting stuff coming up. Um, we post a lot of fun stuff, um, wonderful Wednesdays, Tree Tuesdays, Shrub Sundays, plus some really fun events with prizes. Um, yeah, volunteer info is here too. Um, you can always go to our website. We have a whole section called uh, upcoming events. Um, can't miss it. Yeah, lots of information there. Tons of upcoming events. Um, please feel free. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email is right here. Um, you can also email or DM us on Instagram for a copy of this presentation if you missed anything, you want references or anything else. And lastly, thank you so much for coming to Speak Up 2022. 
And of course, our disclaimer states, if you choose to use any of these plants edibly or medicinally, please do consult an expert and do so with caution and wash the plant very thoroughly, please. Also, don't use plants from New York City parks. Just don't. Um, they might not be safe for consumption, um, but plants in raised beds are best from a city environment. And also if you grow them yourself, of course, that's the best of the best, but yeah. Thank you.